Okay, welcome back to another week of Introduction to Physical Anthropology 110L. Hope you're all doing well. The weather is finally getting nice, so try to go outside if you can, get some fresh air. This week, we're going to be moving from primatology to a more narrow look at our closer ancestors, the human lineage. So between uh, chimpanzees and us, in the family tree, there's a long history going back to a common ancestor several million years ago. And at some point we split off from the animal that eventually became the chimpanzee and started to evolve into something more like a human being. And so we're going to look at how we trace that evolution and the major traits that are associated with it that differentiate us from the rest of the great apes. So our objectives for this week are as follows. Identify the major traits that distinguish the human lineage from other hominids. So hominids include the great apes, chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans, and their ancestors. And we're interested in our direct ancestors from the split off with chimpanzees, our closest uh, relatives. One of those traits is bipedalism, and we're going to be focusing on bipedalism today. So we'll identify the skeletal adaptations associated with bipedalism. And there's more than one kind of bipedalism, so you're going to know the different types of bipedalism and the characteristics that differentiate each type from the others. And then there are a lot of hypotheses as to how bipedalism evolved, and there's not one single clear answer. So we're going to look at four of the major hypotheses and understand why they might be right and why they might be incorrect. We're going to begin with a brief overview of chapter 13, which we're not covering. Uh, so this material will not be on the exam. When we get to the part where chapter 14 starts and the material is testable, I will tell you. But it's important to just have a basic understanding of some of these processes so that we know how the evidence that we're going to look at gets created. So the first thing to understand is that basically every species that has ever existed has gone extinct. Uh, we will probably go extinct at some point, and all the animals that currently exist on Earth, and all the plants, and all the insects, will probably go extinct millions of years from now and be replaced by other animals. And so that also informs our understanding of the human fossil record, that there are many species that existed at one time and don't exist anymore, um, but we can look at where they fall in the history of evolution. So to set the stage for the appearance of primates, we first need to go all the way back to the Mesozoic. So if you were ever a dinosaur enthusiast as a kid, the Mesozoic covers the Cretaceous, the Triassic, and the Jurassic, all the big dinosaur periods. Um, and during that time, for about 135 million years, dinosaurs, reptiles, were the dominant life form on Earth. Um, they filled most of the ecological niches. So there were dinosaurs of all different sizes, from very large to very small. There were air dinosaurs, flying dinosaurs, terrestrial dinosaurs, aquatic dinosaurs. Right? And so that was the, the life, the type of life that was most common. And towards the end of the Jurassic, um, some mammals started to evolve from a type of reptile called a therapsid. And they, the ones that developed were mostly small and ate mostly insects based on the fossil evidence that we have. And we think they were probably mostly nocturnal, so they were less subject, subject to predation. And they were probably often arboreal based on their adaptations. So think back to last week looking at arboreal locomotion. Um, many of the early mammals have similar adaptations to, say, a squirrel. And that probably made them less vulnerable to predation because they could hide in trees. And so at the bottom here, we have a typical uh, reconstruction of what a, one of the earliest mammals, the Eutherians, might have looked like. For the most part, they resembled some kind of rat, shrew, squirrel, uh, weasel-looking sort of animal. It's a you know, long, small, furry, um, insect-eating adapted. And then all that came to an end. So what happened around 65 million years ago? Well, the best evidence we have now indicates that uh, a massive object, either a comet or an asteroid, struck the Earth uh, near what's now a place called Chicxulub in northern Yucatan in Mexico. 
And that object was gigantic. It was at least six miles wide. The estimates range widely from six up to 90 miles wide, but it was basically a rock the size of half of Las Vegas that slammed into the earth from outer space and left a crater uh, over 100 miles across. So uh, over, over the force of 100 million nuclear weapons going off at once. And as a result of that, about 50% of the animal families on Earth went extinct in a relatively short period of time. So a family would be like all felines or all canines. So imagine if every, you know, dog, cat, wolf, or sorry, dog, wolf, coyote, everything that looked like a dog on Earth was killed, uh, wiped out in a, in a year or so. And most of those animal families that went extinct were dinosaurs. Uh, and so then this... You know, threw massive amounts of dust into the atmosphere, blocking out the sun and causing a global temperature drop, which affected reptiles since they are cold-blooded and rely on the sun uh, to help warm them. And we also have evidence that this caused a massive blast wave that reached up to 3,000 miles away. So the impact was in Mexico. We have fossil sites as far away as New Jersey that show um, the effects of this impact. Of the dinosaurs that survived, most of them were avian, and so those became the ancestors of modern birds. Uh, insects were largely unaffected for some reason, and so they stuck, stuck around as a food source for mammals. And so then those small-bodied mammals, a lot of them survived, and they began to move into the empty habitats that had been occupied by the dinosaurs. So now it made sense in some cases to get a little bigger or come down out of the trees um, to adapt to the new circumstances and diversify. And so mammals started to fill all those ecological niches and they were better equipped to survive because they were warm blooded and didn't rely completely on the sun for warmth. So the first primates begin to appear around 56 million years ago. So dinosaurs go extinct 65 million years ago, primates appear 56 million years ago, and we're not really sure too much about the process from uh, evolving from those small tree shrew like animals to primates because in that 11 million year period, sorry, 9 million year period, we don't have a very clear fossil record. And that happens sometimes. There are gaps in the fossil record. So why does that happen? Well, to understand that, we have to review what exactly a fossil is. So a fossil is a trace or remains of an organism that have been preserved in rock in the form of an impression or a cast. So fossils are not bones, they're the aftercasts of bones that were in place that have been replaced by minerals over time. So not every animal becomes a fossil, not every animal dies in a place where it can become a fossil. The best way to become a fossil is to die in something like a swamp or a muddy riverbank where A, you'll be quickly covered up so the bones can't be taken away by predators or broken or worn out by the environment and where the minerals that are around you are conducive to replacing the bone. So sediment is really good, so like a muddy riverbank, because as the bone dissolves, it will gradually be replaced by that sedimentary material, which will then turn into rock over a certain amount of time. If you die you know, on the side of a volcano, you will not turn into a fossil because the igneous rocks in that area will not replace uh, your bones with mineral material in the correct amount of time. So because of that, there are a lot of gaps in the fossil record. We only get good fossils from places that have sedimentary rock um, and periods where sedimentary rock is being laid down or the, the sediment to form sedimentary rock. So there are often periods or locations where we don't have a lot of fossils and we don't understand the transition of evolution in that time and place. And so as you look at hominid fossils going forward, we have to keep in mind that we don't know everything. There's big pieces of information we're missing, and new information is being found all the time. So even while I was uh, Googling for images to make this lecture, I found articles on new discoveries of fossils that change some of the information that's in the textbook. Um, and so that is a constantly occurring process, and we have to update every year to take account um, what is being discovered. So, eventually we find the first fossil primate, um, and the family of primates will review what characteristics they have in common. 
So this is everything from tarsiers, lemurs, and lorises uh, up to our cells. So just to go over this again, um, primates are characterized by a large brain to body size ratio. So their brains are relatively big for their bodies when compared to other mammals. Generalized molars. So their molars are used for crushing, grinding, cutting, various purposes. The ability to climb and leap between branches using grasping hands, in our case, and feet, in the case of most other primates. Having nails instead of claws so that you can grasp and pluck things with those hands and feet. Having forward-facing eyes so you can look at what's in front of you and have depth perception and see in three dimensions easily. And a post-orbital bar or enclosed bony orbit on the eye socket. So we're going to look at how these traits appear in various individuals as we go forward. Okay, everything after this point is chapter 14, and therefore can possibly be on the exam. So what are the hallmarks of human evolution? How do we look at a fossil and say, oh, this fossil is a human ancestor and not just some primate that's on a different part of the family tree, a cousin or a distant relative? Well, there are three traits that we generally look for, and those traits are bipedalism, so walking upright on two legs, very large brain size, so even larger than uh, relative to the body than in primates, and tool use. So tool use is found in some other species, but it's found in all uh, of the human lineage and develops very rapidly over time, and so that's also an important marker. So the first thing to take a look at is the increase in brain size. Um, so our lineage really starts here with Australopithecus africanus, and you can see already that the brain size relative to the rest of the skull is increasing relative to the earlier primate ancestor, and then it increases rapidly over time. So from two and a half, from several million years ago, where brain size is starting to increase relative to body size, it goes up very quickly to by the time you get to Neanderthals and then us, brain size relative to body size has become extremely large, and you can see that in Homo sapiens, the cranium has an increase in size in some important areas in the occipital, right, relative to Neanderthals, and in the frontal. So one of the characteristics of humans is that we have an extremely high, flat forehead because the frontal lobe of the brain is taking up quite a lot of space, even relative to other human ancestors. And we'll be looking at this change in more detail as we get into human ancestors. I'm looking at skulls and the rapid variation in brain size from one species to the next. Now there's an issue here, which is that brain tissue doesn't fossilize. So we don't have any preserved brains from any of these species. So we have to estimate their brain size by looking at the cranial capacity, the amount of space inside the cranium, and assuming that that entire space is taken up by the brain, which is typical in all species. One thing to keep in mind is that if you look at the human lineage, we transition from fossils to bones. So a species that lived two and a half million years ago, like Australopithecus africanus, there are no bones remaining from that species. They are just fossils, right? Everything has turned into stone, essentially. When we get up to Neanderthals, which lived as recently as 30,000 years ago in some cases, we still have bones that are extant. So Neanderthals is a combination of fossil evidence and actual skeletal evidence. One of the important differences today is that we can extract genetic information from bones, but not from fossils. So for Neanderthals, we have the genome mostly sequenced. For Australopithecines, we don't have access to that kind of material. Now, large brains are not unique to humans, obviously. Elephants have large brains. Whales have large brains. But that's because they're huge. So their brain uh, is proportional to their body size. If you take the ratio of the brain size and compare it to, to the body size, our brains are bigger relative to our bodies. Um, so what's really important here is that it's the ratio of brain size to body size. On the other hand, mice have large brains relative to their body size. Their brain to body ratio is actually pretty big. 
they themselves are tiny, their brains are tiny, but they're big compared to their bodies. However, a mouse brain is relatively simple. So what really distinguishes the human lineage is that our brains are large relative to our bodies and they have a complex organization. Remember, we have that large frontal lobe. Well, there's a lot of complex things going on up here in the frontal lobe that distinguish our behavior. Now, that's difficult to get at when we look at fossils because again, we don't have the brains, um, but we can make some estimates based on the shape of different parts of the interior of the cranium and comparing them uh, across different species. All right, another trait that we use to distinguish the human lineage is tool use. So basically this is using objects that are not part of your body to do things, right? And so the classic example is in the human lineage, we have the creation of stone tools that are used to chop and bash things and then eventually to make more complicated tools like arrowheads or spear points, which you may have seen. Well, this can be problematic. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of issues with using stone tools to distinguish the human lineage. One is that we're only looking at stone tools. Why stone tools? Because stone tools preserve really well in the archaeological record. A stone doesn't decay for the most part. The stones that are used to make stone tools are hard stones, and so they can sit around for a million years and then be found in the place they were left and be essentially unchanged. But we know that there are other primates that use tools that are not made from stone. So on the left, we have a chimpanzee there using a stick to dig for termites. And it's actually been a recent find, the first find ever of a Neanderthal rope uh, that just came out last week. And right, we've been studying this for over 150 years and we just found the first non-stone Neanderthal tool. So that tells us that we have a big selection bias, right? that there are probably lots of tools that were used in the past that were not made of stone that we're never going to find. Another issue is that we see that there are species that use tools um, that are not humans. So there are primates that use tools, uh, not just chimpanzees, although they make the most complex use of tools, but also uh, animals like the capuchin or the vervid monkey, New World monkeys, that have relatively small brains, um, but do show very specific tool use behaviors. On the other hand, the orangutan down there in the right-hand corner um, has shown us that, orang that orangutans and other primates can mimic human tool use, um, but they don't understand necessarily how to make those tools, of course. Then finally, there's evidence for tool use in other species that have nothing to do with primates. They're not even mammals, okay? So crows can be trained to use tools and have shown the ability to create tools on their own, like bending a paper clip into a hook um, in order to pick things out of a hole. And octopi have shown some tool use, uh, very different from ourselves, of course, because of their environment, but they show the ability to take things in the environment, modify them, and then use them uh, in very specific ways. So now we have to say that perhaps it's more advanced tool creation that distinguishes us. Um, the ability to make stone tools that are very complex as shown in the center there. But we're starting to see that chimpanzees, for instance, also have the ability to modify sticks into different kinds of tools based on their purpose. And so again, this isn't a perfect marker. So we will look at tool use some more uh, down the line, but it isn't the best trait starting to fall out of favor for distinguishing humans uh, as unique in their behaviors. So, the most important feature that distinguishes hominids is the amazing act of bipedalism, and specifically obligate bipedalism. Uh, we're the only living examples of obligate bipedalism uh, across all species. There are lots of extinct ones, and all of the extinct ones are part of our evolutionary history. So the point where some primate starts walking around on two legs sort of marks the beginning of um, human history or human ancestry. And it is the thing that really sets us apart from all of the other animals that exist uh, in the world. And so we'll be looking at bipedalism in some detail here. There are three types of bipedalism, occasional, habitual, and obligate. Now, we're obligates, and we'll cover that in the next slide, but some of our ancestors were first occasional and then habitual, and there are other animals that are mostly occasional or in some cases habitual bipeds. 
So occasional bipedalism is when you practice bipedalism some of the time. Um, animals that are occasional bipedals rely primarily on some other form of locomotion. So for instance, the bear, right? Bears walk around mostly on four legs. They have the ability to stand up on two legs. They can waddle around on two legs a little bit. They will do that if they're fighting or trying to get into a tree or trying to reach a, uh, a bee's nest to get honey. But they don't walk around on two legs all the time. In fact, it's quite uncomfortable for them to do so. Sometimes occasional bipeds will stand up when they're doing something else with their hands or their front feet. So they may grasp something in their front paws and then walk on two legs for a short amount of time. And because they don't do it very often, they have few or no anatomical adaptations. So we're going to be looking at the anatomical adaptations for bipedalism. Occasional bipeds don't have most of them. They have the body form of a quadruped, and they're just able to stand up briefly. Then you have habitual bipedalism. So habitual bipedalism is when you practice bipedalism regularly, but not all the time. You have access to other forms of locomotion, and you might use those as well. So chimpanzees are a great example of habitual bipeds. They're able to stand up on two legs. They do it fairly often when they need to for any reason, to carry something, to get at food, to keep their arms out of the mud. Um, but they're also able to walk on all fours, and they're also able to break you to a limited extent. So for that reason, they have adaptations for a mix of locomotion styles. They have some adaptations for bipedalism, but not all the ones that we have. And they have some adaptations for those other locomotion styles, which we lack. Right? So they have uh, long, better arranged arms for brachiation. Their feet, their, their hands on the bottoms of their legs, essentially, um, are shaped to allow them to walk around on all fours. And we have some evidence that this kind of bipedalism was being practiced by human ancestors before brains started to grow large. And one example of that is seen with the Latoli australopithecines. So in the bottom left there, those individuals are an artist's reconstruction of one of our early ancestors, Australopithecus africanus, creating the footprints found at a site called Latoli, which we're going to look at. And then you come to us, we are obligate bipeds. So obligate bipedalism is when bipedalism is practiced all the time, right? We have no other locomotion option. We can't really walk around on all fours. We can't really brachiate. We can swim, of course, but for the most part, we are comfortable walking around on two legs and would be uncomfortable doing anything else. And because of that, we have a lot of specialized adaptations specifically for bipedal locomotion. And those allow us to do all the things in these pictures here. So anything that humans do on two legs is basically amazing from the point of view of all other species. So things like jumping over a hurdle on two legs, dancing, and usually here I would show uh, some dance videos to show how amazing humans are uh, relative to everybody else. But I'll put those in a playlist later. And so modern humans and all members of the genus Homo are ob obligate bipeds. That's one of the big markers that some of the australopithecines, which are not genus Homo, um, may have been habitual bipeds, but when we get to genus Homo, they're all obligate bipeds, with the possible exception of Homo habilis, who's one of the earliest transition species. So when did bipedalism show up? We're not exactly sure. It's possible that the first bipedal species may have evolved between 7 and 4.4 million years ago in pre-Australopithecine species. Um, and in that case, it would have been a mix of adaptations for arbor arboreal climbing and bipedal walking that allowed those individuals to be habitual bipeds. But it definitely evolved by somewhere between four and three and a half million years ago because Australopithecines have a large number of the necessary adaptations for bipedalism. So on the far right there, we have a, the skeleton of Lucy, which you may have heard of. If you've ever heard of the idea of the missing link, Lucy was the first habitual biped ancestor discovered as a fossil. And she has all these adaptations. She's relatively complete. That's a very complete uh, fossil hominid, relatively speaking. We often don't find that many pieces of one individual. 
And so we were able to tell from her relatively complete skeleton that she had all the traits necessary to walk upright. And so the artist reconstruction in the center there of Australopithecines shows what they might have looked like walking upright. But they also have uh, some traits that make them more like other primates, especially in the cranium. We'll be covering that next week. So the creation, the evolution of bipedal locomotion is part of a process called mosaic evolution. So we used to think that bipedalism uh, just sort of evolved all at once, that some, some primate was able to survive better by standing up and walking around, and then its, ancestors, its descendants um, did that from then on. What we're now seeing is that the evolution of that trait was probably gradual and happened in pieces. So the different characteristics that we're going to look at over the rest of the lecture probably evolved one at a time at different rates and led to a, a progression of species that were bipedal more and more often and used it more and more successfully over time um, rather than there being a sudden transition from a habitual biped to an obligate biped. So keep that in mind as we cover these, these traits, um, that they probably evolved at different rates. All right, so this is one of our big pieces of evidence. Uh, these are the, a site for, like, called Laetoli in Africa, in Ethiopia, and these are the, the Laetoli footprints. And so what we have here is a preserved lake bed uh, of mud through which some Australopithecines walked uh, several million years ago. And what's particularly interesting is that a lot of the characteristics of these footprints, which were then preserved uh, by being covered in sand and then hardened, <clears throat> show clear traits of bipedalism. So there are only two feet being put down one at a time, right? Not four feet like a dog. And the two, and there are two individuals with different foot sizes, and they're walking side by side which is difficult to do with quadrupeds, you need more space. And the, the way the footprints are imprinted shows us the uh, motion of their foot. So they were putting their heels down first and then rolling their feet forwards and pushing off with their toes, which is exactly what we do. So if you are puzzling over this, stand up wherever you are and walk very slowly and deliberately and think carefully about how you take your steps. And you'll find that this is how we take steps. If you watch a chimpanzee walking, he puts his foot down flat because chimpanzees have no arch in their foot. They can't roll the bottom of their foot like we can. And so their walking motion is very different. So here we have evidence without any bones at all um, that there were individuals in this time period who were already walking upright and doing so very ably. So, they, so chimps, which are habitual bipeds, um, kind of still shuffle around. This smooth walking gait is a characteristic of obligate bipeds. And these footprints are associated with Australopithecine skeletons. So we know that those individuals were, that species was around at the time these footprints were formed and it's presumed that they um, were responsible for forming them. So here we go, the review of the evidence. So there's the heel strike, toeing off, and also their big toe is in line with the rest of the foot, which again is a characteristic of uh, the human foot and is different from the chimpanzee foot. So here is a chimpanzee foot, and here's our foot. You can see that the chimpanzee's big toe sticks out way more. And then here's the skeletal structure of the same thing, so chimpanzee and human. All right, another, so now we're going to look at the adaptations that are associated with bipedalism, and there are a few. The first one, and one of the easiest ones to see, is that the position of the foramen magnum is different in bipeds and quadrupeds, and the more bipedal you are, the further it is under your skull. So in humans, the foramen magnum is all the way underneath the center of the skull, right? And you can think about that if you stand up with good posture, your head balances exactly on top of your spine. And that's very unusual, right? So most mammals, their head is forward. Maybe it's all the way forward. So in the dog, the spine comes in at the back of the head. And of course, as you think about a dog, their 
head is on the end of their neck sticking out. In chimpanzees, their head is forward like this. And in humans, the head is on top of the spine. This allows for the eyes to be facing straight to the front at all times when the head is in the normal relaxed position. So we're not looking at the ground. We're not having to hold our head up constantly in order to see what's going on. Our head just sits there and allows us to look around, um, which is unusual. And this allows our neck muscles not to be overworked. So humans don't have terribly strong neck muscles uh, relative to other primates, relative to, say, a gorilla or a chimpanzee, because our body is constructed in such a way that our head sits nicely on top of our spine without having to constantly be held up. Then we have the mastoid process. This is why we looked at the mastoid process so much when we were doing skeletons, because it becomes important for understanding the process of evolution. So the mastoid process, to remind you, is the site where the neck muscles attach. It's the bump behind your ear, so you can feel that, and you can feel how your neck muscles go up and then attach via ligaments onto the mastoid process. And all bipeds have a mastoid process. They all have neck, mu neck muscles, of course, but in many of them, it's relatively small. Uh, so this allows us to have side-to-side -side movement, right? and you can feel those neck muscles as you move side-to-side, -side, and front-to-back movement. And in all cases, you can probably feel, you put your fingers on it, how those muscles go into your mastoid process, attach into the neck, and govern those movements, right? Quadrupeds have less head mobility, right? So a dog can move its head around, but it can't do the kind of big rolling motion or the kind of up and down motion that we can. Dogs can't crane their head all the way back. If you if you think about a dog trying to look over its back, it arches its back all the way. We can just do this right, and look totally up. So they have relatively smaller neck muscles and a small mastoid process. And so we can go all the way back to the beginning of anthropology, to the comparative method, and realize that we can have a small piece of a cranium, right? We can just have this piece of the cranium and figure out whether the, that individual, that fossil, was bipedal or quadrupedal based on the size of the mastoid process. So that's a great piece of evidence when we have these limited uh, skeletons. Another adaptation that we see in bipeds, especially in our cells, is that the shape of the vertebral column is different. So in humans, the vertebral column is shaped like an S. It has this back and forth curve. The thoracic section is curved out, and the lumbar section is curved in. And that's actually extremely unusual. If you look at most animal skeletons, their spine is relatively straight with a one-dimensional curve. In most primates, the vertebral column is C-shaped. That's why they're hunched over all the time, right? Because they don't have a back that allows them to straighten up all the way. That S shape basically creates a coil that shifts upper body weight to forward and centers it over the pelvis and the lower limbs. So our spine is holding up our body and our pelvis is holding up our spine and our legs are holding up our pelvis. That's not true in most species. The bodies are arranged differently. And because of that, so if you think back to lumbar vertebrae and what distinguishes lumbar vertebrae from cervical and thoracic vertebrae, our lumbar vertebrae are extremely thick, right? And that's because they are bearing the load of the rest of our spine and our torso. And that's also an unusual adaptation. Uh, our lumbar vertebrae are relatively thick relative to the other ones, whereas many animals have relatively small lumbar vertebrae that just go back to the tail. All right, so those large, thick lumbar vertebrae are another adaptation of human bipedalism, and we can look for that. If we just find a partial vertebral column, we can still identify possible bipedalism in an individual. So then that spinal column is balanced on top of the pelvis, and there are pelvic adaptations for bipedalism. The most important one is that the ilia are relatively short and broad. So as a reminder, the ilia are the wing-shaped pieces on the sides of the pelvis here. This is a human pelvis. This is a baboon pelvis, I believe a quadrupedal primate pelvis. And what you see is that their ilia are long and stretched out because, of course, this thing will be horizontal, right? Whereas ours is vertical. And then our pelvis is bull-shaped because the muscle attachments of the legs fit better in that, in that shape. So basically, the muscles of the gluteus, the butt, 
um, have a different function in humans than in most quadrupeds. In most quadrupeds, they're, they're just there to move the legs, but we use our butt muscles to help us stand up straight, right? So we're, if you stand up straight with good posture, you have to flex the muscles in the butt, and therefore they have a different shape and position that requires that bull shape in order to attach to properly. And that also, again, helps to bear the weight of the upper body. So our pelvis is basically forming a ring that our spine rests on top of, rather than an attachment point for our legs, as in quadrupeds. Okay, then, if we look at the lower limbs of bipeds, they're relatively elongated. So in humans, our thigh, basically the femur, comprises 20% of our total height. In gorillas, it's only 11%. In chimpanzees, it's even less. In, say, smaller primates, it's even less than that, right, as they have less and less bipedal motion. And then our femurs, specifically, are angled inward, so that our legs are directly under our body. So again, it's all about load bearing. The torso sits on top of the pelvis, the pelvis sits on top of the legs, and in order to, to keep everything up, Consistently, without damage to the legs, the legs are angled inward to carry some of that stress and put it directly on top of the knee. In other great apes, as in gorillas, they have a curved, naturally curved femur that angles outward. So again, when we find a fossil, if we just find the head of the femur and a piece of the shaft that starts to go down, we can look at its angle and determine if that individual was a quadruped, a biped, a habitual biped, or obligate biped, based on the shape of the femur. So again, we looked at the head of the femur extensively, and the shape of the femur in the bone review, that's why, because it lets us differentiate ourselves from other species. And then we get to the foot. So the foot is holding everything up, and it's our primary uh, tool in moving around, and there are many adaptations in the foot that are specific to bipeds. So we have relatively short toes, even relative to other primates, right? Other primates can grab things with their feet. We generally can't. That allows you to have a lot of support and balance because our toes are not just kind of flopping around. We push off with them. So again, if you walk around barefoot in your house right now, you'll see that you push off with your toes. And we have a non-divergent big toe, the hallux. So our toe, big toe doesn't stick out, which it does in most primates. It's in line with the other toes. And it's relatively short and thick because our toes don't grasp trees, right? We're not using a foot hand to grasp, to grab onto things. But because it's so short and thick, it allows us to balance and stay standing upright without wobbling around. So hopefully this never happens to you, but if you lose your big toe, you will find that it actually causes a lot of difficulty in walking and standing because a lot of the position of your foot and your ability to stay standing upright, standing still, depends on the big toe. And then our foot has an arch in it. And this may seem normal to you. If you look at your feet, they have a curve on the bottom, but that's actually extremely unusual. And that acts as a sort of shock absorber. So when our foot is placed down, our heel absorbs shock first and then the rest of the foot as we roll through our walking motion. And then we have a large calcaneus, the heel bone, that helps absorb that shock. And then when we step forward and push off, our foot acts like a spring, allows us to kind of bounce as we go forward. So I encourage everybody to try walking slowly and paying attention to what your feet are doing with no shoes, walk around barefoot for a minute um, or in socks, and feel the way that your foot acts against the floor. And that will give you an idea as to what these adaptations are doing. If our arches are injured, so if you ever hear of someone that has fallen arches, that's when that part of your foot starts to kind of collapse. Then we walk flat-footed, and that's kind of painful and difficult. Uh, and it's the default mode of locomotion for chimpanzees. So one of the videos I'll be posting is a chimpanzee walking compared to a human walking in slow motion, and you can observe that the chimpanzee walks extremely flat-footed. He's not able to roll his foot like we can or to bounce off of it. And that limits his mobility when bipedal. So there's the chimpanzee foot. You can see the divergent big toe. You can see the lack of an arch and the relatively long 
other toes. So these are all these are all traits that we have lost, and of course our feet look totally different. So you can take a look at your foot, compare it to this foot, and think about what those adaptations look like. And again, if we find a fossil we can that has extant foot bones, which are often difficult to recover, but if we find them, we can look for these traits and see, does this individual have a divergent hallux? Do they have long or short toes? Do they have an arched foot? And what does that tell us about the likelihood that they were quadrupedal or bipedal? All right, so those are the major traits of bipedalism. You should familiarize yourself with them. Those will probably all be exam questions in some form. And then we'll probably be having examples where we look at an individual bone and we determine whether the, the species that bone belongs to, uh, whether it's a skull with the foramen magnum or a femur with the angle of the femur or a foot with the angle of the hallux, the question will be, uh, it was this individual bipedal, were they probably an obligate biped or a habitual biped, and so on. So then the big question is, why did bipedalism evolve in the first place? Right? There's no necessarily reason that a species has to be bipedal. Obviously, there are lots of quadrupeds out there that are quite successful, and there are lots of uh, occasional or, or habitual bipeds that don't seem to need obligate bipedalism in order to be successful. Why did bipedalism evolve uh, to obligate bipedalism in our particular case? And there are multiple hypotheses for this, uh, too many to cover in one lecture, so I'm going to cover the, some of the major ones. Uh, each of them have some supporting evidence, and each of them have a counter-argument. So for each of these, you should be familiar with what the hypothesis is, what the benefits would be, why bipedalism would evolve under this hypothesis, and what the counter-argument is. We'll look at four. So the first one we'll look at is the savanna hypothesis. So, bipedalism appears around 8 to 5 million years ago, and during this time in Africa and Central Africa, which is where um, all early primates, or all early human ancestors, rather, lived, yeah, during that time period, there was a, a loss of forest environment and a spread of grassland environments uh, due to warming. And so the theory here is that if you were coming down out of the trees into the savanna, then you would benefit a lot from being able to stand up. Because in the savanna there's tall grass, and in the tall grass there's food, and also predators like leopards, or ancestors of leopards. And so you want to be able to stand up and look over the tall grass. Right? And if you think about uh, meerkats, those cute little animals you see all the time uh, on the internet, right? they have a habit where they form in groups, and they stand up and look around and look for predators. And so the idea is, here is that some early hominid would have also started doing this, and it would have been advantageous, right? Hominids, the individuals that could stand up and see around in that environment would have survived and reproduced, and probably still lived in the forest on the edge of the savanna, um, and they appear to have only and they appear to have already had habitual, habitual bipedalism. So even individuals that were not in this grassland environment were evolving bipedal traits. So this probably wasn't the driver under that, under that counter-argument for bipedalism. It must have been something else, even if this was advantageous. All right. Another hypothesis is the provisioning hypothesis. And this takes note of the fact that bipedalism evolved in monogamous species, right? We're monogamous, in theory anyway. And so in monogamous species, it's advantageous for males to be able to provide extra food resources to female partners, right? The female partners are choosing mates. The mate that's best able to provide for them is the one they're more likely to choose. And so being able to walk bipedally, like this chimpanzee, frees up your hands to carry food. And so if you can carry food in your mouth and in your hands, you can carry more food, and that makes you more likely to be selected by females and to mate successfully, and to then pass on that trait. There's a counter-argument to this. Um, many human ancestors have high sexual dimorphism. And as we looked at last week, High sexual dimorphism suggests that your social structure is not monogamous, that you are polygamous. 
But those ancestors have bipedal traits. Some of them are even obligate bipeds. And so there must be some other advantage because um, obligate bipedalism evolved even in species that were not monogamous. The fact that we're monogamous doesn't necessarily drive uh, the evolutionary an answers for the rest of our ancestry. A third hypothesis is called the thermoregulatory hypothesis. This takes note of the fact that selection for bipedalism, again, appears to have happened in the open savanna in some species. The theory here is that, well, if you're a chimpanzee on the savanna, which there are savanna chimpanzees today, um, you're exposed to a lot of heat and sunlight. Right? If you're constantly bent over, the sun falls on your back, essentially, and heats you up, and you have to regulate that by sweating, um, and chimpanzees don't sweat that much, and they're covered in fur, which makes them hotter, and that's bad for your survival. So the more you're able to stand up, the more you catch air currents, um, and the less you're exposed to sun, which lessens the amount of heat falling on you and makes it easy to, easier to survive. Right? And the more, you, the more you're able to sweat as well. And so those individuals that stood up more would have been less exposed to heat and would have survived better and reproduced. The counter argument here is that, again, many early bipedal hominids appear to have lived in forests where this was not an issue. And also that there wouldn't have been a lot of impact from this, right? There are many animals that are miserable in the heat, but they still managed to survive and reproduce relatively well. And so there probably wasn't enough pressure from this cause to drive the evolution of bipedalism all by itself. Another hypothesis is the endurance running hypothesis. So this argues that Bipedalism would have enabled us to obtain food in new ways. Um, and it takes note of the fact that there are groups of modern humans that can run uh, at a sustained speed for a long period of time. So I think of right, any, any endurance runner today, the fact that we can run a mile or five miles or ten miles uh, without really wearing out and still being able to do things at the end is very unusual. Most mammals can't do that. Most mammals run in bursts. And then after they run quickly, uh, usually to escape from a predator or to catch prey, they're exhausted and they have to rest. And so there's actually modern groups that do something called persistence hunting, where they um, chase animals for miles and miles and miles and miles until the animal is so worn out that it can't run away anymore, and then they kill it. And this is still seen in some hunter-gatherer groups uh, in southern Africa today, in the Kalahari. And so that drove the idea that if there are modern humans that thrive by using endurance running, that might have been the driver for bipedalism. And so it may have started as an adaptation for covering a big area to scavenge, right? If So many, one of the theories for, for uh, early hominid subsistence is that they were mostly scavenging off of the kills from other predators. So say like a lion kills something and eats most of it, that then the hominids would come and pick at it afterwards, and we see that in some primates, like in baboons. Um, and that, that would have then evolved into covering bigger and bigger distances more and more efficiently, and, and the more bipedal you are, the easier it is to do that. So individuals who were obligate bipeds would have thrived in, under those conditions. The counter-argument for that is there's no evidence for it in the fossil record. We can't see a behavior like that in fossils. Um, it depends entirely on looking at modern human practices and projecting them backwards into possible past behaviors. And so it's not very strong as an explanation, uh, scientifically speaking. So to sum up, we actually don't know exactly why bipedalism evolved. There are lots of suggestions, and I'll be posting a resource on the, on the Canvas module um, that has a link to all the different theories that are out there with explanations of each one. And you're able to adjust the value of different parts of the explanation to create different ratings. Um, there is no set answer. 
you should just be familiar with some of the ideas as to what is going on here. So, homework for this week, take a look at uh, lab 14 in the lab manual. If you have the old lab manual, do exercises one through five, which are essentially a review of this lecture. Use the appendix as usual for the uh, bone resources. If you have the new lab manual, do exercises one, two, and three, skip number four, and then do five and six, and again, use the appendix. Uh, you can turn those into me in the usual manner. And that's all for this week. I hope you're all having a good, or at least a safe and healthy uh, time. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact me. Um, I've been receiving all your homework. I'll have updated grades up shortly. And I'll be posting a link to the final version of this video uh, later tonight. Thank you, and have a good night, everybody.